Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Richard Perring and I'm the learning manager for the Royal Parks. Uh, I'm really glad you could join us here today for this uh, for this session. Uh, if you haven't come across us as an organisation before, uh, the Royal Parks is the charity that manages uh, eight green spaces across London. So we have Greenwich Park over in the east. Uh, we've got Hyde Park, Kensington Gardens and James's Park, uh, Green Park and Regent's Park in the in the centre of London and then Richmond and Bushy Parks. Um, over in the in the in the sort of southwest, and plus we have Brompton Cemetery, which is an incredible space that we manage uh, as well, uh, and uh, Victoria Tower Gardens, which is a a, a small patch of uh, uh, parkland just next to the Houses of Parliament. And um, thank you so much for joining us today. I know um, many of you will have come to us through the Great Exhibition Road Festival, uh, which we're really happy to be involved in again this year. Uh, and I just want to say thanks to the team there for helping to set this um, set this session up. Uh, in the talk uh, this afternoon, I'm going to be discussing uh, one of Hyde Park's most incredible stories. Um, really, it was a, a seminal event that most visitors to the park uh, may never realise took place uh, on the ground that they're walking across. And of course, I'm talking about the Great Exhibition of 1851. Just before we get started with that, a, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I hope that you're seeing and hearing me OK. Uh, I'm not going to just go through the next um, 45 minutes or so um, talking to myself. <laughs> um, uh, your microphone and camera is disabled. Um, we are recording this event to be uploaded online afterwards, uh, but you won't be identifiable by attending today. Um, you can hopefully, however, um, communicate with me uh, by the chat. So you, you should have an option to um, to enter questions or comments into the chat box, or you may have a Q and A function uh, on your screen. Um, and if you send in any sort of questions or comments um, through there, then I'll try and answer as many as possible at the end. Uh, I will add to that a slight disclaimer that I'm not a historian uh, or an expert of some kind on the Great Exhibition. Uh, I'm doing this really just because it's a piece of Hyde Park's history that I find fascinating and. Um, and I've had the opportunity to learn just a little bit about it over the past few years. Um, so if you uh, go to visit the site of the Great Exhibition of 1851 today, um, you'll find uh, a flat open space, uh, which is now used as a group of football pitches. Um, there are a few quite subtle plaques in the ground marking out where this incredible building once stood. And so there's one at each corner um, and then there's a, a slightly bigger plaque at, at, at the sort of where the front and centre entrance was. Uh, but you could well not realise that anything significant has happened in this part of the park. But there's a huge story to be told about about the events of 1851 and the people involved and the and the legacy that the Great Exhibition had. And for us at the Royal Parks, it's it's particularly important to us because obviously it took place in Hyde Park and Queen Victoria grew up in Kensington Palace, which is just a short walk away across Kensington Gardens. And her husband, Prince Albert, was one of the masterminds of the Great Exhibition. Uh, one of the other masterminds, Henry Cole, uh, is buried in Brompton Cemetery, as I mentioned, uh, which is one of the, uh, the green spaces that we look after. Uh, today I'm going to focus on the on the building itself, how it came about, uh, and the role of Prince Albert and his colleagues, um, Henry Cole and others, in, in making it happen. And, and hopefully this will make you want to find out more about the, the exhibition's contents and, and its legacy for yourself. Um, there's Prince Albert and Henry Cole, as I was just mentioning. Uh, and here's a map of um, Hyde Park today, uh, right in the centre of London. But of course, it hasn't always had a huge city surrounding it and um, this land originally belonged to the church uh, and was taken by Henry VIII in 1536 uh, to be used as one of his hunting grounds and that's how uh, all of the royal parks um, st basically started out as Henry VIII's hunting grounds um, and this was in the countryside at the time um, away from what was quite a small um, uh, uh, city uh, and over the centuries of course London has gradually grown and grown and grown and grown around Hyde Park. So, so now it's, it finds itself in the centre of the city. And today, of course, we're used to holding big events in Hyde Park, whether it's the British summertime concerts um, that usually take place here on the parade ground or uh, Winter Wonderland, which is due to start shortly after a hiatus uh, over the past year. 
Uh, and also to our own half marathon, which has just taken place um, uh, 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 the past weekend, uh, which finishes at the site of the of the great exhibition. Uh, if we zoom in on the map slightly there, you can see the site that I'm talking about just south of the Serpentine Lake, um, and it's marked on our own maps there. It's called, called the old football pitches, brackets, site of the great exhibition. Um, so just a, a little note there of something monumental that happened in this part of the park. Um, and you can see here, uh, what the site looks like with thousands of happy runners passing through it um, during the half marathon. And in my job, um, I'm very lucky I get to see just a snapshot of the incredible work and planning that goes into making these sorts of events happen. And to me, that just makes it even more incredible to think that such a, a huge event was pulled off in, um, in quite some style uh, 170 years ago this year. So how did the Great Exhibition come about? How was it engineered? Well, we need to um, look at the lives of two people in particular, um, which I briefly showed you uh, just now. So Prince Albert uh, and Henry Cole. Uh, and we'll start first with, with Prince Albert. He was, he was German uh, and in 1840, 11 years before the Great Exhibition took place, he, uh, he married his cousin, uh, Queen Victoria. And at the time, uh, Albert wasn't actually popular uh, with the public, uh, the British public, partly because he was German and partly because he was shy uh, and he didn't speak very good English. So he was looking for a, a role and a way, a way to be accepted by British society. Uh, in 1843, Albert joined the Society of Arts, which had been set up to award prizes for uh, useful, well-designed inventions. Uh, a few months after he joined, the president of the society died and Albert was the the obvious choice to take over. Um, and the secretary, of, the secretary of the society suggested that Albert should revive the tradition of holding exhibitions. And that's how he met the second man behind the exhibition, Henry Cole, who you can see on the right here. And at that time, uh, Cole was a, a civil servant at the Public Records Office. Um, he was a, an amazing man in his own right. He um, uh, he also studied painting. Uh, he wrote children's books. He probably invented the first Christmas card, and uh, this one here is uh, attributed to him. Um, and uh, in 1840, he helped introduce the penny post, uh, the first cheap way to send letters. So um, quite some achievements ac across his uh, across his lifetime. Uh, Henry Cole was soon elected to the to the council and the, of the society and suggested to Prince Albert that Britain should hold an inter international exhibition in the courtyard uh, at Somerset House. On the, of the Strand. This was the perfect way for Albert to raise his profile. Um, Cole, so Cole got the go-ahead from Prince Albert and he went to do some research at the, um, the Paris Exposition of 1849 to see how he could um, basically how he could beat it. Um, he found that it was big, it was really big uh, and also that it included exhibits from France's North African colonies. So Cole decided that his exhibition should be much bigger, um, that it wouldn't fit in the courtyard at Somerset House, um, and that it should be a truly international exhibition to go one better than the one that he'd seen in Paris. And Prince Albert was in agreement. Cole came up with proposals and by January uh, 1850, the Queen appointed a royal commission under Prince Albert to turn these plans into reality. Albert said at the time that the exhibition would, be, exhibition would be a true test of the point of development at which the whole of mankind has arrived uh, and a new starting point from which all nations would be able to direct their further exertions. And they chose Hyde Park as a location with only 18 months to go before it was due to happen. The Commission uh, decided not to ask the government for any money for the exhibition and instead appealed to people to send in donations. Uh, they raised £230,000, which in today's money, depending on how you calculate it, is, uh, is many millions, about £32 million, uh, pounds, give or take. Uh, they, set us, uh, they set aside 100000 of that, or about £14 million uh, in today's money, for uh, the building itself, and they organised a competition for the design of it. Uh, the competition appealed to a lot of people. They had 245 plans submitted um, to this new Royal Commission for the for the temporary building uh, and the Royal Commission rejected all of them. 
<laughs> and what they did was they put forward their own, uh, which was a hybrid of lots of these plans that have been submitted. Um, it was going to be made of brick and iron, uh, and when they put it out there um, to the media, it was roundly laughed at by the public. Um, so they were in a bit of a bit of pickle, uh, but with uh, with less than a year to go before it was due to happen, Henry Cole met a man called Joseph Paxton, um, who had heard what had happened and he thought that perhaps he could help. Now, um, Paxton was the head gardener uh, to the Duke of Devonshire, who had a big country estate at Chatsworth in Derbyshire. Um, and Paxton was pretty well known um, in, in the gardening world at this point for the conservatories that he built at Chatsworth um, because they were built in a new way. They, um, they had iron supports rather than wood, which was the traditional way of doing it. Um, and their design was pretty revolutionary. It was, it was based on the structure of a water lily leaf. So one single stem um, with supports radi radiating out from that and then cross supports in between them. Now, in, in June of 1850, Paxton was at a meeting in London with um, the MP for Le Leicester, a man called John Ellis. And for part of that day, Paxton and Ellis um, went to the new Houses of Parliament, which had just been rebuilt after a fire um, and, uh, and were going through some teething problems with the building. And Paxton mentioned to Ellis that he thought um, maybe the Great Exhibition Building would, uh, as it stood, would go through the same sort of design problems. Um, and he suggest, suggested a building for the exhibition based on the design of the Chatsworth glass houses. Um, it would have the advantage of needing few bricks. Uh, it could be prefabricated off the site. Glass and iron would be cheap and si simple to put up and could be taken down easily uh, with minimal damage to the park. And uh, he had this flash of inspiration and drew up completed designs in nine days flat. Now, Right from the beginning, there were people who actually didn't like the whole idea of a great exhibition. Um, there was a petition signed by nearly all the residents of Knightsbridge and, um, and Kensington, um, and which was presented to Parliament uh, and it opposed the use of Hyde Park. And at the times, um, you know, even at the time, very influential new newspaper um, initially supported the idea of an exhibition, but soon changed changed sides. Um, so here's a quote from the Times at the time. Uh, it said, the whole of Hyde Park, and we will venture to predict the whole of Kensington Gardens, will be turned into the bivouac of all the vagabonds of London, as long as the exhibition shall continue. The annoyance inflicted on the neighbourhood would be indescribable. Uh, and then in another article it added, by the stroke of a pen, our pleasant park, nearly the only spot where Londoners can get a breath of fresh air, is to be turned into something between Wolverhampton and Greenwich Fair. Uh, which was notorious for raucous behaviour. Um, and I suppose these sentiments are perhaps a little bit understandable. You can imagine, you know, the, the same sort of sentiment perhaps being expressed today on if, if a, a project was announced of this size, you know, the parks can, you know, even more so today, perhaps are, are, are so precious in, in the centre of London. It's uh, interesting to, you know, to, 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 to see that, the, the way that that's reflected at the time as, as well, you know, 170 years ago. Um, perhaps a bit of a difference in attitudes, though, at that time, which um, you would hope we wouldn't get now, was um, that there was actually quite a lot of xenophobia expressed about these plans. Some people were against the idea um, that the exhibition would be open to foreign ma manufacturers as well as British ones. Uh, one of them uh, was one of the main opponents of the exhibition was a man called Colonel Sibthorpe, um, and he described the exhibition as uh, an industrial exhibition in the heart of fashionable Belgravia to enable foreigners to rob us of our honour. Uh, he, uh, he focused in particular on three trees that would have to be felled to make way for the original design uh, uh, of the exhibition building. And he said that they were to be felled for one of the greatest humbugs, one of the greatest frauds, one of the greatest absurdities ever known, all for the purposes of encouraging foreigners. Uh, and Punch magazine, uh, satirical magazine, joined the Colonel's campaign. They said, Albert, spare those trees. Mind where you fix your show. For mercy's sake, don't please go spoiling Rotten Row. Colonel Sibthorpe uh, introduced a motion in Parliament to drop uh, the Great Exhibition, but he was defeated by 166 votes to 46. Um, the show went on and the Royal Commission accepted Paxton's design on the condition that they adjust it 
to avoid removing any further trees from the park. Um, so Paxton added a middle transept to the exhibition building uh, to be built around the trees 108 feet high. Now we'll see those trees in a minute because at this point I'm going to switch over to a virtual reality recreation of the Crystal Palace. Um, we launched this recreation uh, about a year ago or a year and a half ago um, to try to bring this building back to life and showcase what happened in this part of, uh, of Hyde Park. Just bear with me while I put this on the screen. Um, it was so th this virtual reality recreation was uh, was built by the fantastic team at uh, a company called Seymour and Learn, um, who have partners with, partnered with us on this and supported. Uh, also by the Royal Commission for the Exhibition of 1851, uh, who we'll talk more about uh, a little bit later. So hopefully you can see on your screen there a view across the Serpentine Lake in Hyde Park. Uh, Hyde Park had, had never been built on, uh, has never been built on, um, and it would have looked much the same uh, as what you're seeing now really um, at, at the time, minus uh, a cafe over here uh, and um, if we swing round over here, uh, we can see across the lake, you can see uh, Knightsbridge Barracks just behind. Uh, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. There we go. Knightsbridge Barracks just behind, and we've got the Crystal Palace building uh, on the side uh, just over here. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to sort of uh, um, move ourselves immediately across the lake um, to the front entrance of the building. Now, um, the Victorians were uh, were very good at record keeping, so we have a, a plethora of statistics about the Crystal Palace, which I'll just sort of uh, give you some of as we as we start to take a look at the what this building would have looked like. So as we swing around over here, you can see there's that middle transept I was just talking about. Uh, this is the, the front entrance, um, so on the south side of the building. Um, so there's a move around across here. Um, you can't quite yet just get the full scale of the building, but um, you can start to see how enormous it was. Um, now, it, it was the big, biggest building in Britain at the time. Um, there were 3,300 iron columns used to, to put it up, 2,150 girders. Um, it took 900,000 square feet of glass in 293,655 panes. As I said, good record keeping from the Victorians taking these details down. Um, and 600,000 cubic feet of timber. And it was built in five months, um, just five months, by 2,000 men working incredibly quickly. But the area inside was six times that of St Paul's Cathedral. One unique thing uh, about the design was that Paxton designed pipes which would hold the iron columns together and act as drainage for water. You can see these pipes here. Um, and these stretched to 34 miles worth of pipes, and they were mainly manufactured with special machi machinery on the site itself. Now, the pipes also had grooves in them, the, the cross beams, so that they could run trolleys across them um, to, to carry the glass plate panes into place. So they almost had a bit of a production line going as, as they were putting this building up. Um, so they put the glass planes into place. After the glass came the painters, and then when the paint was dry, Another team built the display stands and, and gradually started filling them with the 100,000 100, exhibits that, that made up the Great Exhibition. And it was Punch magazine uh, who christened this building the Crystal Palace. Just before we go inside it, we're going to uh, just pop down to the, uh, stay on the outside and pop down to the eastern end. Again, we're sort of teleporting over now. So um, down to the eastern end uh, of the building. And again, if I sort of swing around here, this is the side view of the building. Um, as you can see just here. Um, and as the building started to take shape, opinions gradually changed about it. So this is sort of illustrated by um, a poem by William Makepeace Thackeray, who said, uh, but yesterday a naked sod, the dandies sneered from Rotten Row and cantered over it to and fro, and see it is done, uh, as though twere by a wizard's rod, a blazing arch of lucid glass leaps like a fountain from the grass to meet the sun. So he was impressed. 
Uh, but when the time came to actually open, London was heaving, and that's you know, perhaps not illustrated by the by the imagery here. We've just got a few kind of um, people uh, scattered around to give the building uh, you know a sense of perspective. But um, but Hyde Park was uh, was heaving. London was heaving. Um, hotels and boarding houses were booked up. There were huge traffic jams with all the carriages trying to get around. Um, there were five cavalry regiments and seven battalions of in infantry that were stationed in Hyde Park to deal with any trouble. Um, and 6,000 extra police were on duty in London. But actually, in the end, um, all these all this concern about everything going horribly wrong and, you know, um, a lot of concern about um, crime and um, sort of antisocial behaviour, I suppose. Um, in the end, it wasn't really borne out. There were only 12 pickpockets arrested during the whole five and a half months that the exhibition was open. Um, so generally uh, all peaceful and, uh, and, and, and uh, civil. Um, we'll just go back around the front again and then uh, and then take ourselves through the through the front door. Here we are back at the, the south entrance um, and we'll just go in through the front entrance here. So here you can see the um, the elm trees that the structure was built around. Um, so there's, there's one in front of us there and there are two further ones behind. There's a great story about these trees, about a, a problem um, that they had with these trees right before the exhibition opened. Um, it said that a flock of sparrows had, had uh, decided to, to nest in the elm trees inside the Crystal Palace building. Um, and the organisers, <laughs> the organisers raised this with Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. You'd think they want to keep it, keep it quiet from them, but they raised it with Queen Victoria and Prince Albert on one of their many visits before the opening day. Uh, the royal couple summoned the Prime Minister um, and the Prime Minister recommended shooting them. Uh, but <laughs> Prince Albert pointed out that this would um, smash the glass. Um, so then they apparently asked Lord Palmerston, who was one of the commissioners, um, and he recommended poison, uh, which Victoria and Albert were not convinced by. Um, and then they consulted the Duke of Wellington, the same Duke of Wellington um, uh, who was, you know, famous, had a famous career, um, <laughs> military career and uh, been prime minister. Uh, previously, his his first reply was, the Duke is not a bird catcher. Um, and then he apparently thought about it again and answered, Sparrowhawks, ma'am, uh, which apparently solved the problem. Now, I don't know how much of that um, that is a, sort of a slightly embellished story, but um, it, it's a nice one. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the, the exhibition itself opened on uh, the 1st of May, 1851, um, which had been declared a public holiday to celebrate. 500,000 people on that day were in Hyde Park itself, of which 30,000 were, in, you know, had tickets to be in the Crystal Palace building. And just to get a sense of the scale of, of the crowds, if you compare that with you know, the modern day concerts that we have here, um, we have about 60,000 people attending, you know, each concert in the park and that feels pretty busy. But so 500,000 people packed into Hyde Park, um, it would have been quite an atmosphere. Um, on the opening day, they had a model frigate on the Serpentine Lake, uh, ready to fire a salute on the Queen's arrival, uh, which is a brilliant idea with all that glass around, of course. Um, the Times warned that the, they said, the concussion will shiver the glass roof of the palace and thousands of ladies will be cut into mincemeat. Which is quite a thought. Uh, the gun was fired and thankfully the ladies were OK. Uh, but at 9am uh, on the 1st of May, 1851, the first visitors entered um, to see before them these trees, um, the central fountain and a throne uh, from India covered in crimson velvet and, and statues of Victoria and Albert on horseback in this central area. Uh, and at about noon that day, the royal procession rode west along Rotten Row and then into the north entrance of the Crystal Palace. So down the far end from where we're virtually standing here. Um, after the opening speeches, the royal couple joined Joseph Paxton and the commissioners to tour the exhibition, and Victoria was impressed. And um, she wrote of the opening day, it was the happiest, proudest day of my life, and I can think of nothing else. The tremendous cheering, the joy expressed in every face, the vastness of the building with all its decoration and exhibits, the sound of the organ, and my beloved husband, the creator of Peace Festival, all this was moving indeed. And after that, uh, Victoria visited the exhibition regularly. 
I think, you know, just looking around as we stand from this spot, looking down the length of the building on each side, um, you know, today we're used to being in buildings like this and, you know, perhaps in exhibition spaces, arenas. Um, we're even used to, you know, big temporary structures being put up from time to time. Um, perhaps, you know, the Millennium Dome is the most recent comparable idea, although that turned out to be a fixture, but it was you know, obviously intended to be temporary. But, you know, you imagine Victorians um, seeing this space for the first time and, and, you know, would really have had no nothing, no basis for comparison with, with seeing something like this. So uh, really, you can understand how it would have made such an impression. I'll talk a little bit about what was in the exhibition. So you can see in our virtual um, reality recreation at this point, um, we've recreated the building only. We uh, we haven't yet been able to populate it with um, with the contents of the great exhibition itself. Um, we hope to do that at some point. But um, uh, at the moment, you know, this 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 really focuses on the building and uh, and hopefully gives you a sense of the scale and um, and and what it would have been like to walk into a place like this. We'll just move a little further into the center. And you can see another of the trees there. Um, and right in the center here, you can see this, this fountain. Um, this fountain was 27 feet high uh, and made of four tons of pink glass. Um, and as well as being a spectacular centerpiece, it was a pretty useful meeting point for people because um, obviously the exhibition was extremely busy um, and it, it helped to cool the air inside as well because on a, on a sunny day, being a glass um, building, uh, it would have got pretty warm. Um, within uh, the exhibition building, there were 14,000 exhibitors presenting 100,000 exhibits across 11 miles of stalls. Um, broadly speaking, foreign exhibits were on the eastern side, so down this end, and British exhibits um, were over on the western side. So we gave ourselves half the space, more or less. Um, it was organised by, uh, within that, with, organised by country and then further by type of industry or, or, or product. And the full name of this exhibition was actually um, the Great Exhibition of the Works of Industry of All Nations, which is quite a grand title, but actually it's almost an understatement considering what was on show, the variety of what was on show. Um, there was jewellery, so for example, um, the Koinur diamond, uh, Koinur meaning the mountain of light, uh, which was the world's largest known diamond in 1851 and was one of the most popular attractions of the India exhibits. Um, although actually it was notorious and, and, and a famous uh, exhibit, but many people reported finding it disappointing in real life. Um, that diamond has been recut since and is now part of the crown jewels. Um, uh, so there was jewellery, there were musical instruments. Uh, Victoria mentioned the the organ um, music. There were giant organs at each end of the of the building, um, and a, a further selection of musical instruments. There was industrial and agricultural equipment, um, like a, a huge hydraulic press. Um, there were vehicles, trains, fire engines, marine engines. Uh, there were building materials and architectural models, uh, textiles weapons were on display, food, uh, medicine, uh, lots of art um, and furniture. Uh, and there were some quite odd exhibits as well. Uh, there were false teeth that were designed to be yawn proof. Uh, there, were, there were carriages that could be drawn by kites. Um, one of the most famous odd exhibits was a bed that ejected you at the time that you set it to wake you up um, by, by, by tipping, literally tipping you out of bed. Um, which I don't know why that hasn't caught on really, but uh, but it didn't. Um, there was um, lots of other stuff. There was a model of um, Liverpool docks with um, 1600 accurate miniature ships in it. Uh, there was a, a cigarette rolling machine that could make 100 cigarettes a minute, uh, which sounds like a bad habit. Uh, there was furniture made from coal, uh, a knife with 1851 blades, presumably an acknowledgement of the year it took place. Um, but I don't know how practical that would be. Uh, a false nose made of silver, a buttonless shirt, a prototype submarine from France. Um, you can see a display of 15 machines to show the whole process of cotton spinning. Um, there were gas cookers, electric clocks, um, primitive washing machines, um, and a, a, a patent envelope maker, so producing 60 envelopes a minute as well. So um, this mass production idea is starting to develop. 
Um, at the exhibition, there were also a pair, uh, a pair of cottages, full size cottages on display, um, and they'd been built by the Society for Improving the Condition of the Labouring Classes, which was another of Prince Albert's societies. Um, the cottages were designed to be affordable and healthy buildings for, for working people in large cities, uh, which was obviously was, was a, a problem that the, the Victorians were, um, were, were facing. Um, they, uh, these cottages had running water, indoor toilets, um, fresh air and separate bedrooms for children. Uh, and, and following the exhibition, many of these features were then included in, in many houses actually built in towns and cities. So um, uh, an influential design. And if you want to see what they look like, one of the cottages is actually now in Kennington Park in, in, in South London. Uh, America, for their stand, booked too much space and struggled to fill it. Um, they sent a, a, a fairly strange selection of items, including piles of biscuits, mounds of soap, um, 6,000 fossils uh, and a piano that could be played by four people at the same time. Uh, China, on the other hand, um, booked some space but sent nothing. Um, so the organisers had to scour British shops and warehouses for examples of Chinese produce to put in it. Um, but of course, you know, we, we've sort of focused on these quirky uh, sides to it, but there was a phenomenal amount of useful innovation on display too, um, arising from the uh, Industrial Revolution. Um, we're going to go down to uh, to the western end, so just sort of see uh, down the western side. Of it. Oops, it's not me. It's down this side. There we go. Um, so from where we're standing at the moment here, we're looking back to the eastern end, so you can just about see the far end of the building there. Uh, and we're at the western side here. And um, so to the south side over here um, were shawls and woolen fabric. Um, and behind that uh, was hardware, so locks and things uh, and agricultural machinery. And then over on the north side over this this way um, was a display of minerals uh, and then beyond were carriages and locomotives. Uh, in the distance over here was um, one of the refreshment courts. Uh, 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 there were a couple of these and sort of a pre precursor to the modern shopping centre food court um, and the first uh, paid for public toilets, uh, which cost a penny to use uh, and gave rise to the phrase spending a penny. Um, and uh, as you saw in the photo that I showed right at the beginning of the modern day um, modern day site, the Victorians did a, a good job of clearing up the exhibition without a trace. Um, but about five years ago, uh, we did find the remains of one of these toilets while doing uh, we were doing some maintenance work on on, on the ground, uh, and, uh, and and we found some, some of these remains and some of the underground drainage pipes um, that were installed for the Crystal Palace building are actually still in use. Uh, we're going to go back outside again now um, over to the Albert Memorial. So again, viewing um, the building here from the from the western side. Um, the Great Exhibition closed after um, just under six months and six million visitors. Uh, it actually closed on the 15th of October 1851, so it'll be 170 years ago this Friday, uh, which we, we really should have done this talk on Friday, too, so it would have been neater, but um, 170 years ago um, uh, this week, um, the Great Exhibition closed. Um, Prince Albert announced the end of the exhibition and, and distributed the prizes um, to, the, to the winning entrants because there's a sort of bit of a competition uh, sort of aspect to it. Um, this is how the, the, the Times reported that day. They said, as soon as the national anthem had, as soon as the national anthem had closed, there arose such cheers as Englishmen alone know how to give. Um, these were continued for several minutes, and when the last of them had died away, there passed over the entire building a tremendous rolling sound, like that of thunder, caused by thousands of feet stamping their loyalty upon the boarded floors. Joseph Paxton put a proposal to the government to, to leave the building in Hyde Park, uh, but this was refused. Uh, and it was taken down as planned and, and rebuilt even bigger in Sydenham in South London, uh, which of course gave rise to, um, to, to, the, um, to that area's modern day name, Crystal Palace. Uh, and that building uh, unfortunately burned down in 1936. Uh, the Great Exhibition made a profit of about £186,000, which is about £27 million uh, today's, uh, today's money. 
uh, which was uh, which was used to establish South Kensington's cultural quarter, uh, including the Royal Albert Hall, uh, the Natural History Museum and the Victoria and Albert Museum. Uh, many of these museums exhibits, first exhibits came from the Great Exhibition uh, and some are still on display today. Um, the Royal Commission of 1851 continues uh, as an organisation as well as supporting this project that we've um, that we've done to recreate the, the building in virtual reality. Uh, the, the main piece of their work is to use the remaining funds uh, from the exhibition to support research in science and engineering and, uh, and other uh, projects uh, uh, with, with a similar cause. If I just sort of swing around on this view here in our recreation, you can see the modern day Albert Hall. Um, and in fact, I can switch on to today's this view. I can toggle uh, onto today's view. So comparing 1851, uh, you can see these trees relatively young to today. Um, where the trees have matured and the, the area is, is, is empty. Um, and of course, at the time, um, out the Albert Hall and the Albert Memorial didn't, didn't yet exist. Um, but I think this is a, fin a fitting place to finish the talk uh, because Prince Albert was one of the mainstays of the Great Exhibition. Here he is um, sitting up at the Albert Memorial here. Um, he visited the site regularly when the building was being put up. He helped to raise the money and he dealt with many of the problems that arose along the way. Excuse me. Uh, even before work began on the Crystal Palace, he wrote to his grandmother. He said, I am more more dead than alive from overwork. The opponents of the exhibition work with might and main to throw all the old women into panic and drive myself to crazy. Uh, well, he didn't he didn't go crazy, but he probably did work himself to death. Uh, his workload was considered to be a, um, a factor in uh, in in, uh, in his eventual death. Uh, and he died within 10 years of the um, of the great exhibition taking place. The cause was given as typhoid, but but many thought that the um, the Great Exhibition had put too great a strain on Albert. Um, after his death, uh, the, the story of how the memorial came to be is, is a whole whole other one. Um, uh, and we have a, a walking tour, actually, there's one coming up soon, but we run them a few times a year um, where you can go inside the fence of the memorial and hear the full story of how the memorial came about. And it's a, it's a fascinating one. Um, but it, it, uh, it, it was put up uh, to celebrate his life and his role in the exhibition. Um, and uh, you can't quite see from here, but um, in his statue he's holding the exhibition catalogue. Um, around the base uh, over here, uh, so there are four of the four corners, there are the four continents that took part in the Great Exhibition. And up on the podium over here, uh, uh, represented of the industries of agriculture, manufacturing, commerce and engineering, again, all represented at the exhibition. Um, lots of designers were involved in uh, different aspects of this memorial. Uh, but the overall design was by George Gilbert Scott and the, the statue of Albert by uh, Thomas Brock. And what about the other two key players in the in the exhibition, Paxton and, and Cole? Uh, well, Paxton was knighted on the opening day of the Great Exhibition and, and later became MP for Nottingham. Uh, he died in 1865 at the age of um, age of 61. Uh, the doctors recorded the cause as heart and liver failure, but uh, again, other people felt that uh, maybe well, Henry Silver from Punch wrote more fatal overwork. Um, Henry Cole lived longer than either Prince Albert or Paxton, um, and he became superintendent of the government schools of design in 1852, which eventually became the Victoria and Albert Museum. Um, and he stayed there until he retired in 1873. Uh, he was knighted in 1875 uh, and died age 74 in 1882. Um, so that sort of brings us to the conclusion of what, uh, what I was going to cover. I'm just going to um, take this off the screen for a moment. Um, and I just want to see if there are any questions. Now, um, having a look here, I think it's either possible that the question functionality, the question and answer functionality isn't working properly, or I've just covered everything that everybody wanted to hear because I don't have any. Um, so that's fine. If, if anyone wants to sort of pop anything into the chat, if you have that accessible now, I hope it's working OK and that you've got that facility. Uh, apologies if not. For, I don't know why that wouldn't be the case, but um, uh, yes, if you've got any questions, do feel free to, to pop them in now. Um, just before we wind up, just a couple of things um, that you know, a lot of people uh, ask uh, when we when we talk about the Great Exhibition. Um, one thing is about how the working classes viewed the Great Exhibition. Um, 
so to start with um the entry price was set fairly high it was three pounds for gentlemen two pounds for ladies uh, but it was quickly lowered um, to allow much broader access and, and by the end of uh, May 1851, it was only a shilling per head. So that made it really relatively um, easy for people to access. Uh, and people did travel a long way to attend. Um, Thomas Cook, uh, the, the Reverend Thomas Cook, started um, enterprisingly organising um, uh, organizing trips um, for people to, to visit and uh, then went on to make a name as a travel agent, uh, but started out by arranging trips to the Great Exhibition. Um, but uh, it was certainly it was a good level. Uh, there were people from all all, all sections of society um, uh, attended the exhibition in a way that hadn't really been um, accepted before for um, for uh, in Victorian society. Um, the other thing is, uh, I suppose that we can go back to is how they raised so much money, um, given that they didn't have funding from the government. As I said, it was funded by public subscription, um, and the the organising committee held banquets to raise funds. Um, uh, manufacturers and businesses uh, were underwriting it and, and they even circulated collection boxes uh, in working class areas, which uh, may seem a little bit odd, I suppose, but um, the view at the time was that um, the, the working classes would benefit from the, the knock on effects of the exhibition um, as much as anyone else did, so they could be asked to contribute. Um, and uh, it, it was felt that this, you know, this would help to move British standing forward, British industry forward, and would therefore improve, you know, improve the working class's lives and offer job opportunities and that kind of thing as well. So, um, so it was a pretty successful fundraising effort, obviously, and th and then the exhibition went on to make a a, a pretty enormous profit as well. So, um, a big financial success. Um, I am going to put a link to the um, virtual reality. Crystal Palace into the chat box here in the hope that you can see that um, so that you can go and explore it uh, yourself. I would love it if you would go and have a look around. Um, you might have spotted within it there are some icons that you can click on for more information and for archive images of what the exhibition um, itself would have looked like within the building. Um, we also are um, shortly launching a um, augmented reality version. So um, compared to so the virtual reality version is accessible on any computer um, uh, just from, from, from the comfort of your sofa. Uh, the augmented reality version is accessible via an app um, which you can download and then um, basically use it as if you're walking around within the building and it's designed to be used at the site itself. So if you go to the site in Hyde Park, uh, you can open it and through your phone you can um, you can view the recreation in situ at the right scale and walk around the entire ground floor as you like. Um, the app also enables you to, to do that in any open space, so you can open it on the sort of uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a big area or even sort of scale it down so that it sits on top of your table and you can have a look at it. Um, that app is uh, is uh, going to be available shortly. And we also want to, as I mentioned earlier, go on and uh, um, continue to uh, work on this project and start populating it with aspects of the Great Exhibitions exhibits as well. So um, that's something we hope to be working on in the next year or so. So do keep an eye on our website if this is something that you're interested in. Um, just to, to wrap up, I, I, I'd just like to say thank you for joining us today. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, the Royal Parks is a, is a charity um, and it costs tens of millions of pounds every year to care for these beautiful and historic parks. Um, and of course, like other organisations, the impact of COVID, uh, COVID has hit the Royal Parks charity hard um, as we've faced a significant drop in income um, by not, not being able to run um, you know, major events like the ones we talked about, amongst other things. Um, if you enjoyed today's um, session, please do consider making a gift to the charity. Um, you can visit www.royalparks.org.uk slash donate to learn more. Um, also on that website, you'll find um, a list of upcoming events. We've got walking tours um, in person within the parks taking place uh, uh, regularly. Uh, and we'll also have a, a, a programme of online sessions, uh, more online talks taking place uh, as, the, uh, as the winter goes on. Um, the final thing I'd ask of you is uh, in the chat in the moment, I'm going to pop in um, a, uh, a link to a survey which is, um, uh, has been created by the festival organisers. Um, and we'd really appreciate if you, if you take a minute just to fill that in. Um, uh, we uh, we really value uh, uh, what you uh, uh, your feedback, and we'll uh, we'll use it to make things better in the future. So um, uh, if you just uh, would stick with us for a moment, I'll pop those things into the chat. But uh, 
uh, aside from that, that's all from me. And thank you very much for taking part today.